Okay, let's do it. speaker tonight, Dr. Julia Miller. We both graduated from that school at the same time. Um, since then, though, she has gone on to greater things, and she's <laughs> now a professor in dermatology here at that school. She's also a secret horse person, so we're very glad to have her tonight. She's going to talk tonight about um, a couple common skin conditions in horses, but unfortunately, if you're around horses long enough, you'll deal with um, So scratches and hives, but I'm sure she'll be happy to answer a lot of other questions. So she's a very interesting lady. Thanks, Julia. Topics. 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 <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Cool. Thank you, Lindsay. I'll stand over here, but I might move around because I feel so far away. Everybody sat on that side of the room, which is fair. Um, so today we'll talk about two topics that we see a lot scratches or distal limb dermatitis for the fancy folks. Um, and then we'll also talk a lot about hives at the very end. But first, we'll kind of hit up scratches talk about how we see that. So I found this picture on the internet and I quite appreciate it because I have no idea what mild horse soap is. Um, but apparently on WikiHow, that's what you use when you're cleaning a horse leg. Um, also, what I like to point out, ooh, does this work? Ooh, kind of. I'll go over here. Um, is this person wearing gloves? I mean, what kind of a horse person is wearing gloves? <laughs> Anyways, I know, it's a great picture. So we're gonna talk first about scratches, and scratches is really just a general colloquial term, and it only describes a reaction pattern on the skin. It doesn't tell you what's wrong with the horse, it doesn't give you a diagnosis, it just tells you what's the clinical picture of the horse's leg. Other things that people call it, pastern dermatitis, dew poisoning, mud fever, grease heel, you've heard lots of different names for it, but scratches kind of encompasses it all. So what are the clinical signs? What does it look like? Scabs and crusts is the number one thing that we tend to see. That's what most owners recognize. We can also notice some hair tufting and the tufts of hair because there is a scab or a crust underneath there, so just look closer. Um, hair loss, sometimes we can see that. That's usually a little bit further down the line. We also can see some oozing underneath the crust. That's always very fun. I enjoy a good ooze. They can be painful when you touch them, particularly the red-headed mares. They don't like to be touched, period. Um, and sometimes you can see that the legs can get swollen as well. So lots of different presentations of scratches, um, but it all is a very similar look. You can see in this picture, we've got a horse that's got some notable scabs and bumps and also some areas of hair loss. And this is affecting mostly the cannon bones, but down to the pastern. And then sometimes we just see it on the caudal heel here on the back of the pastern. Either way you cut it, scratches is what we call it. The three P's are where I like to start with scratches. We all get excited about how to treat it. But the real truth is, to know how to treat something, you have to know what caused it. If you don't know what caused it, you can't figure out how to treat it. And the three P's of scratches are very important. First, we need to think about the predisposing factors. And I'm going to argue that these are the most important. Environment that the horse lives in. How many of us have dry pastures in April in upstate New York? Zero, negative 20. Um, nobody does. It could be negative 20 degrees, so you never know. Um, humans, what are we doing to our horse? We are guilty. I'll get out of these sparkles. And then also the coat color. Is this a chestnut like horse or is this a white red horse? That can be different. Next, we think about the primary factors. And primary factors are things like the physical irritants. Again, what are we putting on our horse? Ectoparasites, we'll talk more about those later, different mites and things of that nature. And then certain immune mediated conditions can be primary factors. And then finally, the place where we all get really excited are the perpetuating factors the bacteria and the fungi. Is this staff? Is this ringworm? We want to know. But the real truth is, it's these predisposing factors that I'm going to harp on more and more. Because I don't care what you do to treat it down here. If you didn't treat it upstream, you will never be successful. So there are many causes of scratches. And we want to get into our technical terms. 
I like to write here that there's usually an initial wound, some form of trauma, or even wet skin. And we'll go a little more into that later. But that's usually what perpetuates scratches. All of these other things are kind of secondary problems for most of the horses. Rain rot, ooh, over here, most of us are very familiar. Ringworm, bacterial infections can happen. Allergies, including, including Filicoides hypersensitivity, which is an insect cause hypersensitivity. Environmental allergies, my most favorite. Choreoptic mange, photosensitization, vasculitis, contact irritants, chronic progressive lymphedema, and there are others. This is not an exhaustive list. So that's just to get your brain thinking about all of the different things that can cause those scabs that you're seeing on your horse's side. There really are a lot of causes and most of us just get focused on the treatment. So now we're gonna go through a few of the different causes. This is just a picture to show what most of our pastures do look like in April in upstate New York, right? So here we have, I'm not sure if it's a pond or a pasture, very difficult to tell, um, but that's what we do with lovely horses. But what is going on with their vista when they are immersed at all periods of time, right? Very hard to get them out of there. I bet you there's a hay feeder right here, um, so all of the horses are gonna hang out around it as much as possible. By the way, whenever I was in practice and people said, look at my pasture, it's so dry. I'd walk around the corner and I'd see where their hay feeder was. And let me tell you, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, it was a mud pit right around their hay feeder. And I'd say, excuse me, Mrs. Smith, the pasture's not that dry. And then we would all take a walk around to go, oh, you're right, I understand why. So pay attention to the whole pasture, that's really important. But I want, this is my beautiful um, <clears throat> new drawing, so let me know if it's terrible. Um, I wanted to talk to you about what water does to skin because wet skin really can predispose a lot of horses to scratches. This is supposed to be, in that nice drawing, the normal skin cells, the keratinocytes that are right here. And these are awful purple bacteria on the outside of the skin. When you have normal skin, these purple bacteria have no way of getting through into the inside of the skin where they worry us and they can cause an infection. Now this macerated skin is when you've got the water that happens. Anybody been in the shower and you've seen that nice little prune that happens on your fingers, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of what this looks like. So these are the skin cells right here that happen and they spread apart when your skin is exposed to that much water. Now when the skin cells spread apart, that bacteria that was happy on the outside is now very happy to go on the inside and can set up shop and create an infection. So that wet macerated skin is what allows that bacteria from being on the outside where it's fine and doesn't cause any trouble, it can now move to the inside where it can cause lots of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Next we'll go into some specific causes. So rain rot, or fancy word, right, dermatophilus condolensis. Does anybody know what it is? Is a bug? Is it a bacteria? Is it a fungus? Anybody? <laughs> Even my bed students don't know, so fair. It's a bacteria, very good. This is a bacteria, very nice. So this is a picture of rain rot, and this is to show you the little dots. These are each a single bacteria, and they create sort of a railroad track-like appearance. So that's the classic appearance for rain rot. And B-bed is a bacteria. That's how we can diagnose this, and we can actually look at it under the microscope and say, cool, that's what that is. Now, there is a seasonality to this particular condition, right? We tend to see it a lot more in the spring and then also in the fall. Why do you guys think we see it more in those seasons? Our horses have long coats and it's in theory raining more. Now, you can certainly see this in July in upstate New York, or if you live in a tropical place, which some of us do, um, you can see this year round. But the big thing is the hair coat on the horse is longer in the spring, usually, and longer in the fall, right? And it's that long hair coat that when it rains, now the hair coat gets wet, it gets matted down onto the horse's back. The back can dry, that skin gets macerated, like that picture we just showed you, and then that normal um, bacteria that's hanging on the surface not causing a problem is prone to causing a lot of problems. The reason it's important to think about that is one of the key features of treating rain rot or any condition where a horse gets wet first is clipping. Clipping can help tremendously. Keeping the horses dry makes a big difference. Normally, we think about rain rot in the common location at the top line, right? It has those really nice big crusts. You peel them off, and it's green and juicy. Very satisfying. Again, most horses do not appreciate that you do that. And also, fun fact, this is zoonotic, which means that you can get rain rot. So do be careful. It's not very pretty. You should get it on your finger. Um, but that is a possible thing. The other fun thing to remember about rain rot is the crusts are contagious. So unless you really hate your next-door neighbor, you don't want to sweep those crusts into their home stall. Not a nice thing to do. You want to take those, put them in the trash, whatever you need to do, but unless you don't like them, you might keep them. Middle thing here, we talk about the legs. So we can see rain rot on the distal end. People don't think about it. They 
only think about rain rock on the back of a horse. But the reality is rain rock can be in many other places, which includes the discipline, and that includes scratches. And then the third presentation, which people don't think about very often either, is actually called dew poisoning. How many of you have seen the white muzzle ponies, but then end up looking very pink and having some crusties and scalies around the muzzle? So what happens to those ponies is they're out eating in the grass, it's very wet in the dewy grass, right? And you get that macerated skin and they can get their rain rock from that. So those are the, the three presentations that come. Next we're gonna talk about a staph infection. This looks pretty similar, right? It looks bad, sure, yeah, but it looks pretty similar. It's crusty, it's scaly, it's on the back of the leg. I can't tell you if this is rain rot or this is staph. I'm pretty good at guess, um, but I can't tell you that, right? So what I can do for that is I can do an impression cytology and try to figure it out. It's just these are very dry lesions and that's not even very rewarding in my hands. But the point I wanna make from this is it looks quite similar to rain rot. The seasonality for this, we think spring. Spring is the most common time we see staph in horses. Spring is when we start to ride our horses again. We maybe didn't wash our tack all winter, which is a shame. Uh, the horses have a long hair coat. They're sweating a lot under that hair coat. That can predispose them to rain rot, but also to staph infections. So that tends to be that seasonality. But I have seen staph present all throughout the summer, all throughout the winter. So this one doesn't have as much seasonality as we thought it was. Coryopsis mites, fun little dudes, or dudettes. Here it is. This is the Coryopsis mite. When we're thinking about these, we're thinking about draft horses first and foremost. Do you know why they like draft horses? What's the unique thing? They're hairy, they have feathers, right? So they like the feather breeds. So this could certainly be a Frisian, this could be a Shire, this could be a draft cross that's heavily feathered. Every now and again, it happens in a non-feathered horse, but that's usually not a common presentation. These tend to be very itchy. How do you think a draft horse tells you that it's itchy in its back legs? What are you going to see and call me about? Biting, yeah, they're remarkably agile. It's incredible what they can do. They can turn right around and bite those back limbs, even these huge 2,500 pound horses. What's another thing you like? They can rub, yeah. They can also stomp. They'll stomp a lot. So if you ever go, and I don't mean to pick on the Amish, but if you ever go to an Amish farm and you're watching all of their high sales or Belgians stomping, that's because they have choreopathies. They all do. I promise you this. Um, so that's a pretty common thing to see. This is contagious to other animals, including you if it really had to be. It does not prefer to stand on people, it prefers the animals. Um, but if you have a goat in the area, by the way, it's always a goat's fault in general. Um, but if you have a goat in the area, it can be contagious to that, it can be contagious to your donkey, contagious to the other horses. These mites also have a really good off post survival. They can live in the, the debris, they can also live in your wet shavings. How long do you think they can live? Yeah, the ballpark. Yeah, 90 days. That's crazy. So you treat the horse and, the, and you don't get rid of the shavings and those little buggers are living off post for 90 days. And that's a scary mite, right? Um, but that also makes getting rid of them a bit difficult. We do see the seasonality on these to be more winter time. And it's winter time because everybody's inside close quarters. That being said, if you have a herd of fell ponies or a herd of gypsy banners, they just self-perpetuate and you're gonna see choreopathies in them at all times. But this is always on my list of, of things to think about when I have a draft horse. They are surface feeders, but they can even, when the horses itch themselves, you can actually end up with some very sick conditions. Photosensitivity is another thing that can cause some issues on the distal of your horse. Now there's two different kinds. Primary photosensitivity is where the plant touches the horse's leg and it's actually that contact that sensitizes the skin. Secondary photosensitivity is where the horse ingests the plant or has another piece of liver damage. The liver itself doesn't function well and then they can't excrete the right plant parts, and then you get sort of a systemic photosensitivity. Now what that means for us is that if you see a horse that you think has photosensitivity, the first thing I do is I check its liver values. Because if that horse has liver disease, I need to know about it and I need to treat it right now. It can be very hard to say whether something is primary or secondary, but I'm always thinking about secondary first and making sure that that's not it. And there are different plants in different parts of the world. These are some plants that are local to us. Things to think about, you do not want to see these in your pasture. Um, when we see photosensitivity on a horse, it tends to be the white-haired skin. It doesn't like the colored skin. It really only likes the white hair, and that's an important part that you're going to see. Seasonality, well, they have to have plant exposure, so the good news is you only have to worry about that for like two months out of the year. Here's some photos of a photosensitivity horse. So this horse has got some nice <coughs> chestnut right there before the socks. Perfect skin. I couldn't ask for prettier skin. You get to the white part of the skin, and holy moly, that looks terrible, right? It's oozy, it's red, it's very severe. Another 
another thing here, the chestnut part of this horse is not affected at all. And then you get to the white haired part and it's very affected. So if you see that, I always ask that question. Someone says, hey, my horse has scratches on one leg. I always say, what color is that leg? And if it's got three chestnut limbs and one stocking or sock, and it's the sock that's affected, then I'm worried about photosensitivity in that horse. Vasculitis is something that stinks, to be honest with you. But this is one of the more common causes of that scratches that just won't go away. You can't get rid of it. And the reason you can't get rid of it is there can be sort of an underlying immune-mediated condition. Um, these tend to be very well demarcated. See how sharp this is? Very sharply demarcated lesions. They can also go deeper. You can see the skin almost peeling off of this horse here. The limb can get swollen. These tend to be a bit more severe in nature. But I will throw this out as a differential for that pesky scratches that you just can't clear up. It could be vasculitis. Now I say call your vet because this is going to require steroids, whether they be topically or if you put them in the horse's mouth, that's fine too. But you're going to want a vet to look at this to decide that that's what you need to do for treatment. A biopsy of the area is certainly something that's recommended before you treat this because it's not a cause that is often forgotten. Chronic progressive lymphedema is just fun to see. It's really not fun for the draft horse. Poor draft horses, they've got it hard. Here they are again. Um, this is really a condition that's only affecting the draft horses, love to us. Often the shire breeds, the Belgians, we do too. And what happens is the lymphatics of the leg are supposed to kind of drain the lymphatics down here and then they pump them back up and shoot them out. But what happens in these draft horses is they lose the ability to shoot all the fluid back out of the leg. So it gets trapped in the leg. When the fluid gets trapped in the leg, you end up with this very sort of corrugated cardboard like appearance. Do you guys ever heard the term grapes? These horses will get what's called grapes. So this is a long progressive process. As you can see, it's very nasty here. This is a horse in Georgia. When it gets to this point, I can do zero things for this horse. There is no treatment, unfortunately, for this condition. Um, and it goes missed for a lot of years, usually. And why is that? There's feathers covering those legs, so most people don't even see them. So if you are an owner, breeder, lover of the draft horse, I highly encourage you to palpate back there and, and check the legs and make sure they feel normal. Catching this early is helpful because diligent man diligence management is critical. They're very prone to secondary infections. We've got it all the coreopsies mites, like we talked about. So if you can treat those things and get on them ahead of time, you actually stand a better chance of prolonging that horse's life. This can be a euthanizable offense, honestly, from what I've noticed my poor horse. So what do we do? This is my little <laughs> miller, um, the side eye that she's very famous for. So what are we gonna do about scratches? We saw all these really cool causes. The nice thing is we have a lot of treatments that are gonna work to treat any of these causes. I just wanted to make you aware that there are a number of different things that, that do predispose them. But the good news is you guys can treat with a lot of the same stuff. And civil liberties. So environmental management is critical. This is everything. I don't care what you slather on a horse's leg. I don't care what antibiotics you pump into their body. If you are not controlling the environment and the management of that horse, you're going to really squat. You are never going to have success. Pastures are the biggest thing. And this is, by the way, the hardest, right? It's really easy to get a shot of penicillin. It's real hard to get a dry pasture in May in upstate New York. But that's what's really important. You want to avoid mud. I like to tell my students, this is poop water, right? Mud in a horse pasture is poop water. I don't care what you do about it. And that horse is now standing in poop water. How good does that sound? Not good to me or to them or to anybody, right? Um, and so that certainly predisposes them, just like with the wet skin. Now it's wet skin and bacteria. If they're standing in this, I don't care how much desitin you put on their leg, it's never going to help that horse, right? So you want to try to avoid the mud if at all possible. That can be very difficult. That may mean that if you have a horse that's predisposed to scratches, it doesn't go out in the springtime. I'm sorry, that sucks. But that may be what happens, or you're just going to be deep in the battle of scratches. Avoiding standing water is super important too. If you've got that nice big river in the middle of your pasture, is there anything you can do? Can you cordon off a certain section? Can you keep your horses away? That can really help if at all possible. Mowing the grass is something we don't think about. This pony here, first of all, probably doesn't need that much grass. Um, I'm gonna get super fat and get in a minute. Side so note. But one of the things we think about, have you guys ever walked out into the grass early morning in the summertime, you look down and your pants are all wet? That dew is pretty potent. There's a lot of water on the dew. We love to let our horses out in the morning and the evening when the dew points out. So if you really have tall grass, then they're essentially bathing their distal limb the entire time they're out mowing the grass down for you, and that can actually predispose them too. So keeping your grass nice and short so that the dew is not all over the legs can make a big difference in this too. Plus, it's good because most horses don't use that much grass. 
right? What needs to be the cup. And then removing manure. That's nobody's favorite thing to do, but it really is a useful thing, not only for the distal end issues, but also for your strong giles, your other intestinal parasites, right? It keeps your pastures healthier. Removing manure really is a big thing you can do for that. And then stalls. Oh, shoot. Back. Mm -hmm. um, stalls are really important too. One of the things I've gone into a number of barns and I'm like, look how clean my stall is. And on the surface, it's beautiful. But I grossly dig underneath the straw or I grossly look underneath all of that shavings and it's just an ammonia wet bath under there. So remember that you have to clean that stall thoroughly and to the base and keep it clean regularly. Um, because if you have a horse that's taken out of the mud pit, but then into a nasty, thick um, straw stall, that's not actually going to help that horse very much. And you don't want to bed them too deeply. Air is your friend. You want the horse's limb to get exposed to air. And so by doing the, the bedding a little bit more shallow, that really helps us keep the air there. And then now, clean and dry. This is the mantra for all things with distal limb issues with horse. And this is the most important thing. If you do not get this step, I don't care what you do next. It's not going to help anything. Horse management, also super important. Clipping the affected areas can make a big difference. The thing is, don't go hog wild with your clippers and cause a bunch of razor burn, right? And you go the next day and your horse is all swollen. You just need to clip the big hairs off. That's the big thing, right? But clipping the area can make a big difference so that you don't get all that wet hair macerating the skin. You want to clean and dry the skin anytime the horse gets wet. Who likes to bathe their horse? It's like one of my favorite things in the world to do. Yeah, I love it. I do it all the time. Now, where do we sweat scrape a horse? Where do we sweat scrape a horse? Body. How many of you sweat scrape the distal limb? Good for you. Not because it's doing a very good job with that, right? Especially when you have those like metal scrapers or like hand going like, oh, that hurts. And a lot of horses don't like that. Most people that bathe their horses pay attention to the knee, down to the knee, and then they stop paying attention. And then they put that past horse out in the grass, and they're like, oh, you'll dry off eventually. Well, again, I'm going to mention upstate New York or in a tropical place. They'll dry off four hours later. They'll be dry. But that four hours is enough time for that skin to get damaged enough to predispose them to bacterial infection. So don't forget those distal limbs when you bathe the horse. It's really important that you dry them off. And this is not every horse every time. These are the horses that are predisposed to scratches. So if you pay close attention to that, <coughs> you also want to have nice, clean boots and tack. That's really important, right? Our SMBs, they don't wash all that well. We know that. Um, but it is important to wash them because if you just went through all the poop water and now you're putting the nice, muddy boots back on, the horse's leg that's already kind of irritated, it's not going to help. And I also say here, and I mean this very thoroughly, do not share. We do not know what that neighbor's home has, okay? Don't share it. It could have ringworm, it could have rain rot, it could have everything. Just let us know. There's always one pony that carries a rain rot and takes it with you. There's always one. Don't share. That's a life lesson. Teach yourself. <laughs> the other thing I like to show everybody is don't scratch scratches. Who is a picker here? Oh, no. It's really bad. Don't be a picker. I know that it's very hard. But in general, you should try to let the crust kind of come off on their own. If it one's coming off on its own, that's fine. You can remove a little bit of it. But nothing pains me more when I walk around in the spring in a barn and I see all the girls in their britches, or boys, you know, in their boots and their britches, and they're down there with their curry combs, going up the distal limb. And then the next day, I see all the horses hobbling out of their stalls, limbs swollen up, and they go, oh, it's just a scratch as he gets every year. Breaks my heart. What you've done is you've taken that bacteria that was on the outside, not so happy, you shoved it deep into the leg. And those swollen legs are what's called a cellulitis. They're bacteria and they're inflammation deeper in the skin. And you have only but one person to blame for that, and that's yourself. So don't scratch scratches. I don't want you to go crazy with the curry comb. If the crust want to fall off, perfectly fine. But don't get in there and go too crazy. It's really hard. Now we're going to talk a little bit about shampooing. And we'll talk about the challenges with these. Everyone has a favorite shampoo they like for their horse for scratch. And that's great. I'm open to whatever works for you, certainly. But there is a challenge when it comes to shampooing appropriately. So what are our principles? First, we're going to want to clip the hair coat. We know that that's important. Second, you should pre-bathe to get rid of some of those crusts. We're not scrubbing, but try to get rid of a little bit of the crust that's there. Next, you're going to want to use your medicated shampoo for 15 minutes, not that time. That's bad. Mm -hmm. I can't raise my hand. Mm -hmm. um, we'll put it on the clock. Okay, at 7.40, then we can all rinse our ponies off. Okay. Um, no one, no one. Let me tell you, no one. Other than some of my very diligent like poodle owners, they will do it. Um, but in general, nobody bathes for this period of time. The truth is, if you squirt a bunch of medicated shampoo onto a horse leg, rinse it off one minute later, you might as well just rinse it with water. 
you've done nothing, zero things, other than yourself, feel good about yourself, and that's it. So the contact time, I think, is probably the biggest problem with shampoos of our only treatment. Um, you have to also dry well afterwards, that's an important thing. And then for really to be effective, you have to do it once a day, at least for the first week. When it is April in upstate New York, could be 25 degrees, one never knows, right? How keen are we on letting something sit on our horse's leg for 15 minutes once a week? It's wet. The horse isn't fond of it. You're not fond of it. I'm not fond of it. So it can be difficult to do shampooing appropriately. And I see a lot of treatment failures when it comes to shampooing. And I think it's just because it's a great treatment, it's just hard to do it right. I will say this, sell some blue if you want something cheap and over the counter. Sell some blue is great, it's just an anti dander shampoo. Um, but it works really nicely. It is actually antibacterial and antifungal. Um, it's one of my favorite decrusters, if you will. It has that beautiful green color, which we all like. Um, so that's a cheap one you can add in. I really like the Kinetic Vet line. They have a lot of nice shampoos and whatnot. Um, any shampoo you like that works for you is cool. Anything that's got chlorhexidine I like. There's things that get your antifungals. Um, a lot of different treatments that could work there. And then the Betadine soap. I see a lot of people use Betadine. Um, I'm okay with that. That works okay. Um, it's just it, sometimes with the white horses, it's not as good. But if you like it, I'm open. Uh, micro -check -check. Sure, yeah, with micro check shampoos. Absolutely. This, though, is my magic. Okay. So, lime sulfur dip, who's heard of it and who's smelled it? Um, but here's the magical wand because this truly is God's gift to man. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful product. And it does it all. I call it LSD because it's trippy how good it works. That's why you can remember, right? Um, it smells like rotten eggs. It will tarnish your beautiful jewelry, so do be careful with that. I have to wear gloves because I'm actually allergic to it, but it's still worth it. I would put on a whole Tyvek suit to do it if need be um, because it does do it all. This is going to treat bacteria. This is going to treat ringworm. This is going to treat other fungi. This is actually going to treat those disgusting coreopsis mice that we saw. They hate this stuff. It's going to remove your crust. And it can actually reduce inflammation and itch in the legs, too. That is like the most bang for your buck. You can't get anything else that has that much bang. And it's dirt cheap, as my mother brings up. Dirt cheap. This bottle, this little guy, is usually only eight bucks. You can get like 12 treatments out of that. I mean, that is what is better. Now, the smell is horrible, but that's how you know it works, right? And when the smell is that bad, something gets out of your mind. But there is an important thing with the technique here. By the way, it's over the counter. You don't get I told that's what I told you, um, but that's true. The pre-washing the area can help you, but you don't have to, but getting off some of those scales and crust can help. I put here dilute to three to four percent as critical. I, I love horse people. They say, hey, if a little is good, a lot is better. Um, not the case with lime sulfur. If you put it on at the full concentration, which is about 99%, you can strip the skin off completely and make the kennel go away. I had a few animals actually die. So it's, it's a serious thing. You do not want to put it on full screen. But when you dilute it to 3 to 4%, fantastic. The other nice thing is on the bottle, it has dilution instructions. You don't even have to do that. It's right there for you on the bottle, easy to do. You want to spray or sponge it onto the affected areas, whatever works for you. You just want to get them soaking wet. And then you do not rinse off. This is a dip. You leave it on the horse. Now, if you have that beautiful horse with white bristle and white feathers, it will stain it yellow. So maybe don't do it the day before your, your big show. That's something to think about, right? It will stain it yellow. Um, the staining does go away, I promise you that. Um, but that's something that you'll see immediately. And then I like to do this daily for the first four to five days. And then I go to once every seven days after that. Now, if you have a horse that's prone to scratches, it might just get its once a week lime sulfur spray for the entire spring battle <coughs> that you need to do. And that's okay. You're not going to cause any harm by using this product with some regularity. So I really enjoy it. The other thing I want to say here is you want to treat it past resolution. Don't just say, oh, he looks a little better, I'm going to stop treating him. No, I want him to get better, and that can take time. That can take three, four, five, ten treatments. It really depends on the horse. So don't forget that you may need to treat these guys for over a month, even two months, to get full resolution. Don't give up. I promise you it's worth it. Ointments and creams, we all have our favorite one, and they can be useful, but you do have to be careful with these. The times you don't want to use ointment, Anytime that you've got a lot of oozing on the leg, because the ointments are going to hold the moisture in. Also, if you've got a really furry leg, the last thing you want to do is hold moisture. That you have to cook before you use these. Um, and like I said, anything that's oozing, you want that juice to come out. That's the body's response. So you don't want to pack desitin on there so that the ooze actually can't come out. You're likely to get a deeper in there. So my mantra there is if it's oozing, <coughs> don't want it. 
Okay? It's okay to use ointments to protect the limbs for some early lesions, um, but in general, I'm not a huge user of these. You know? Things that I've seen people use, diaper rash cream, A and B ointment, perm ointment. Again, if you like it and it works for you, that's okay. Just be careful with that one. And then there are prescription creams, silver sulfidizing. This one here is a lifesaver. Pretty sure it fixes diabetes. Is that good? I don't even know. Um, and then Eupirocin is another one. Now, these are veterinary prescription products. So if you have issues, that might be something your veterinarian might want to use. Other over the counter treatments that are there. And there's a variety, right? So, MTG, much like lime sulfur, just not as good, in my opinion. Um, greasy. When I was in South Carolina, everybody made their own MT MTG. They took the bacon grease from the kitchen and they added sulfur granules. And I knew that I was in an MTG barn. So I was like, it smells like a rotten breakfast in here. And I was like, oh, we were using MTG. No surprise. I'm like, oh, that bad, that's it. So um, it was pretty <laughs> wonderful, though, so I always knew. Now, I'm not mad about it. That product works pretty nicely for a lot of horses. I just think lime sulfur is actually superior. That's why I recommend it. The Vetrisin product, this is a really nice combo. Vetrisin has a lot of over-the-counter products. They work very hard. They actually use bleach products. Um, bleach is fantastic. A really good antimicrobial antiseptic, and the skin tolerates it very nicely. Um, and the Vetrisin, all the different products that they have, I like them a lot. You can get them over the counter, so whatever works for you. And then, of course, I always hear people talk about, you know, Miss Sally's famous blue and the blue stuff, the purple stuff, that green stuff. Everybody's got their favorite slather that they put on a horse. And I'm okay with you having a favorite slather. That being said, if you put your favorite slather on, you're like, no, that my horse is just getting worse and worse. Remember that topical reactions are possible. Maybe your horse doesn't like the blue stuff. It's actually not good for the leg. So if things are not getting better, you need to stop what you're doing and think that you could be causing that harm. So be careful with that. So when are you going to need to call the vet? It is important to know when you have to. Obviously, if you see this leg, you should be like, ah, oh, it's not good. I'm not going to put corona on that call of the day. Um, if any time it looks really bad to you, this is a very deep ulcerative lesion. This is a nasty vasculitis case. This horse actually lost its foot. Um, so not something you want to mess around with. You don't sit on these. If it looks like this, you call the vet. If the limb becomes really swollen, you call the vet. That could be a number of things, including the distal dermatitis. That could also be other things. If your horse is lame, <coughs> plain old scratches rarely causes lameness, right? So if your horse is lame, always you should talk to your vet. Um, but this is something you want to consider there. And I mean quickly. But then I also say if it's not improving in seven to, to ten days, that's a short time frame, right? But if you've been doing what's always worked in the past, and we're now a week, almost two weeks into it, and it's not getting better, just give your bed a ring. They might have an idea of what you can do. You can get your spring shot at the same time. I'm not just saying that it works for everybody. So what your vet may recommend, there is a whole lot we can do to diagnose what's going on with the leg. They may recommend all of this. They may recommend none of this. That's kind of up to what works for them. So a skin scrape is what we're going to do to find that choreopathy mite. We want to find that little bugger, so we might recommend that. Surface cytology is how I know if I've got a bacteria or maybe even a fungi. I might recommend that. Bacterial culture tells me if it's a bacteria, what bacteria is it? What antibiotic can I use? Bacterial resistance to antibiotics is a very real thing. We see it all the time. So they may have to do a culture and see what we've got going on there. A ringworm culture is something we do with some regularity because if it's ringworm, yes, that's treatable with that. Um, if it's ringworm, we want to treat it a little bit differently. Skin biopsy is that vasculitis case I showed you earlier. Even I have to biopsy that. We biopsy that to know what's going on. And then they might recommend that instead of doing all these things, which are wonderful, and I love them, they might recommend that you treat on your best, your best first guess, and that's okay. Oral antibiotics might be recommended. You know, everybody's seen the light SMD pill. That works pretty nicely. I don't recommend you use it, though, if you don't need to, right? So make sure that you, you've kind of exhausted all of the roots and you've called your vet about that one. If you have some leftover in your barn, don't just toss it at every horse that has scratches on their leg. It's not appropriate in here. Um, they may say that you should change your topical antimicrobials to something stronger, something prescription. Or they may recommend topical steroids. For those vasculitis type cases, steroids can make a big difference. All of these things are things you want to chat with your veterinarian about before pursuing. And they may recommend, oh, the fantastic thing, it almost never happens, referral to a dermatologist. I love seeing the cases that nobody else can fix. It's kind of my favorite thing in the world, right? Um, so if you've got that case, it's really hard to add your bed out 40 times, say, hey, what about a dermatologist? I'm so happy to see you. We all be happy to see you. Come on out to us. And then a mantra. It's a life mantra, right? If at first you don't succeed, you mess something up. The definition of insanity, right, is repeating the same thing and expecting different results, right? 
So if your treatments that should be working are not working, you've missed something. You need to do more diagnostics. I say exactly this to all the veterinarians. I say it to the veterinary students. Okay. It sounds like a really basic thing, but it's like banging your head against the wall. Don't keep banging your head against the wall. Find a different wall. You know, figure something else. <laughs> Next, oh, I wanted to just show you all the mantras, right? So clean and dry, cleanliness is next to God, it's important. Don't scratch scratches, very important. If it's oozing, no ointment. Unsalted if it's just a jam, it's the best ever. And then if at first you don't succeed, you messed up. Call your vet, okay? Um, and again, I say the same thing to veterinarians, but that's really important. Um, if at first you didn't get it right, that's cool. We have other treatment options. Next, we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is hives. Um, this is just a fun picture. I'll show you a billion more. So the fancy word for hives is urticaria. Horses are hive machines. It's like their favorite thing to do. Um, cats hate making hives. Horses love making hives. It's their favorite. So what are they? They're right. They're raised, soft swellings. They're usually kind of round in appearance, and they have a flat top. When you touch them, they're often kind of squishy or boggy. They can be donut shaped. That's a common thing that horses will do too. They're usually anywhere from half an inch, but they can even be all the way up to eight inches in diameter. That's big. Um, like I said, horses love to irritate, so that's one of their favorite things. They can be itchy, but they're not always itchy. So some horses are covered in hives and just sitting there eating their hay. Other horses have five hives and they're ripping themselves to pieces. It just depends. And they can be anywhere on the body. How do you know if it's really a hive? This is a fantastic question, and the one I always ask everybody. The beauty of a hive is that it needs to disappear in 24, 48 hours. It's an immediate allergic reaction, and then it goes away. So if you've got the bumps on this horse right here, and I'm like, ooh, are these hives? I don't know. What I recommend you do is draw around one of the bumps with a marker, right? Because that horse could get rid of one hive and replace it with another one very close, and then you go out the next day, and you're like, I don't know. Is that the same bump? Is it a new bump? I can't tell you. Well, now that you've drawn around it, you can tell me if it's the same bump or a new bump. If you go out and that bump is still there after 24, 48 hours, that is not a high, okay? If you go out and that bump is gone, even if there's new bumps, that was a high, and then you can say, okay, great, I'm going to the doctor. So just to show you some fun pictures, they make beautiful patterns, just very lovely. Frightening looking. This is actually a horse that has what's called cold urticaria. Every time it goes out in the cold, it gets high. Wild, right? <laughs> Uh, another great hive maker. This horse was not itchy, weird, just like it should be. My favorite urticaria, which is very rare, and nobody really gets to see is called urticaria, and that's this. You see these beautiful little stripes there. Cool, can you see? And then another thing to bring out, a lot of horses will sweat after they get high. So this horse actually doesn't have any hives left, but they can be very, very sweaty after the fact. That's a common thing that horses So what causes hives? This is a big mantra, and it rhymes, isn't that nice? Food, bug, or drug? Food, did you get a new shipment of hay, right? Is it a new bag of grain? Did you switch grains? Um, is it the same hay, but you're storing it in a different location? Anything that's going into the horse's mouth, we're calling it food, right? Bug, is it a true hypersensitivity to a bug, like a two or hypersensitivity? Is it a single high from a single bug bite? Who cares about that in all reality? Um, but you can definitely see um, bug bites cause some issues too. And then the big stingers, the, the flying aliens, that we like to say, um, those can certainly cause hives as well. And then drug. Now, most of us, when we think about drug, we're like, oh, it's like an antibiotic or something going into the body. This, again, is a pretty broad subject. So this could be a supplement that your horse is on. This could be a joint injection that your horse got. This could be from the adequan that you're putting in the muscle. Drug is a very loose thing. It could be the shampoo that you're putting on top of that horse, allowing that. It could be a new bug spray. I've seen horses get hives from new bug sprays. Um, so thinking food, bug, and drug as the main cause here. And when do you need to call your vet when it comes to hives? If it's just one or two and the horse isn't bothered, you don't need to call your vet immediately. Please don't call a vet at 2 a.m. on a Saturday for like three hives. Um, but if they're progressing to severe swelling, that's something that you need to pay attention to, particularly if they're progressing to severe swelling in the facial area. That worries me. Does that horse have an allergic reaction? It can end up affecting its airway. And if that's the case, you need a vet on hand, not, not 20 minutes from now, you need one now, right? So that's an important thing. If they're recurrent, so there's a bunch of hives, they went away in two days, that's great. Three days later, you got a bunch of hives, they went away in two days, okay. Four days later, you got a bunch of hives again. Call your vet. You're missing something, you need to do some more diagnostics and figure that out. 
if the highs won't, oops, <laughs> if the highs won't go away. Now, the bed bumps it doesn't go away, aka the top high, that's the question. Um, but certainly if they don't go away, you want to get your bed there. And then I say don't go away, 24, 48 hours is usually what I, the amount of time I'm going to give them. And then if the highs begin to ooze, crust, and become painful, unfortunately, horses will sometimes get such bad highs that then they actually exude serum out of the highs, then that can crust up, that's a great bacterial mediator, it's like a petri dish. And then you can get a secondary staph infection. You got a cardio death from that happening. So if you said, hey, my horse had hives four days ago, and now he's losing his hair, his skin is painful, there's crusts everywhere, you want to get your bed out to save the trauma. So what are we going to do to treat hives? The biggest thing, if you can, and this is not easy, is find and eliminate the underlying cause. And this is where you have to be a little Sherlock. That's what's really important. Is there any new variable in this horse's life? Did you change from smart pack to platinum performance pack? Is it really doing that? Like I said, they love to eat hives. Is there a new hay? Did you get it from a new source? Same source, different field. Is there anything in there? Grain, new grain, different grain, new bag of grain. Bedding, did you change your bedding? That's a common thing I see some horses do. Your turnout is. What's your shampoo? What's your tack? Did someone bring a new barn made in? And what did they bring with them? And then, of course, like we talked about drugs and all of the things that are used to so go in there, be a Sherlock, sit down, write things down if you need to. I found that that really helps and see if you can figure out what's different in that horse's life. If you find out it's different, great. Go back to the way it was before. Hopefully that will get rid of your highs. Now let's say you can't find anything different or you change back to the way things were and your horse is not getting better. That's when we start thinking about Band-Aid treatments, right? So the Band-Aid treatments we have include antihistamines. These do work in some horses. Good old Zyrtec here is a pretty nice one. Um, it's affordable, which is good. Get on Amazon.com, so that's one we highly recommend. Hydroxazine is another one that works well. Try the granules when you can find them work great. But the big thing I want to say here, if you're in a sanctioned competition, they're illegal. Antihistamines are illegal. So I think it's silly, but they say that it would slow your horse down, um, and therefore that's why they're illegal. But you have to think about that when you're showing them. Other Band-Aid treatment, treatments we have, there's all sorts of cool goop on the internet, you know, antihistamine-like things. I can neither confirm nor deny it. Really. It's just um, what I say is, if you've got the money to spend and you want to try it, more power to you. Um, but some of these are very expensive, and that bothers me um, because I can't guarantee that they work. Omega-3 fatty acids can help. Platinum Performance, for example, makes a skin and allergy supplement, which is high in omega-3s. That can help, and it's something I often recommend people try. But it's usually not going to be the end-all, be-all. Smartish also, or Smart Pack also makes a Smartish ease. That's one thing. There are also topical anti itch medications, products that contain steroids, hydrocortisone, or sometimes promoxine, which is like an analgesic for the skin. That can help, um, especially if you've got an itchy horse. And then under veterinary guidance, steroids are a great band aid treatment for hive, right? Hive is an allergic reaction. We want to calm the immune system down. Steroids are the best thing we have to do that. Now, again, you want to do this under veterinary guidance. Steroids can be dangerous to horses. Anybody know what a high dose steroid can do to a horse? Feminitis, yeah, it can make them walk right out of their feet. So you do have to be very careful with that. That being said, if I've got a horse that's covered in hives and is progressing and not being able to breathe, give it steroids. Give it all steroids because you know, they can't breathe fast. So you know, that's very important. The other thing that we can do when you've got a high beat horse, you've gone through all those things, they're not working. What can your veterinary dermatologist do for you? As it turns out, I can do so much, right? Um, so diagnostics are what I can offer you. Diet trial, that sounds weird. Horse diet trial, what are you talking about? It is weird. Um, but this is something that I've done. I've changed grains. I've really sat down with a client and we've talked about the hay sources. We've had the hay tested. Um, so diet trials are things that can help out here. And then intradermal skin testing, which we're doing on this cute little mini right here, is one of my most favorite things to do in horses. It's something I do a lot for the urticating horse. So this is a picture of an intradermal skin test. So what we do is we inject the allergen directly under the skin. And these are hives. We did that on purpose. And we want to see the horse make a hive. If I inject the allergen and the horse makes a hive, that tells me, cool, that horse is responding to that, he's allergic to that. This is a very big reactor. You can see there's a few bumps over here that didn't do much, it did not react to those. It's reacting to a lot of other things. Um, what we do with this is I say, okay, now, and we test them, by the way, for here's 60 things, at least 60 injections. As you might imagine, they do a little sedation. I don't care how good they are, needles, even the thoroughbred needle. 
Um, so it's important that they get a little sedation. We do this, we read the test. We actually have you guys read the test 24 hours and 48 hours later. You tell me if a bump showed up, so it's a nice group activity for everybody. Um, and then at the end, we say, okay, here's a list of things that your horse is allergic to. What can we do about it? Now, the thing is, everyone says, oh, great, I'm going to avoid what they're allergic to. So how do you avoid bragging? Actually, better yet, don't tell everybody. Just tell me. We're going to have a proprietary conversation in the book at Heritage um, because there's literally no way. You can figure that out. We can solve many allergies. So unfortunately, avoidance can be very, very difficult, and that's often not why we do these tests. I have had a few horses, for example, that were alfalfa allergic, and I pulled them off of alfalfa and fed them very expensive irritant. Light brown. So every now and again, we do get something in a horse that's avoidance, but in general, avoidance is not possible. So what do we do with this information then? We want to do immunotherapy or the allergy shot. What we do here is we desensitize the horse to what they're allergic to, just like people. People get this shot too, by injecting into them what they're allergic to. Now, dogs and cats, it works decently well. It actually works really well in horses. I have great success with this. Um, I can see results in as quick as one to three months. In a dog, it can take a year. It really can take that long. Horses, when it works, it's going to work, and it's going to work pretty quick. As far as cost goes, this is nothing. This is a very cheap thing to do. We cost about $400 for the testing. Your first vial for the immunotherapy is going to cost you another $300, but that's going to last you eight months. $700 bucks to treat your horse? That ain't bad, right? When it comes to horse. So when you're talking about things that are cheaper in the long run, the allergy shot really makes a big difference. This is something I do a lot of. I really enjoy doing it. I've had great success with horses. Anecdotally, I've had some success with PV horses as well. We wonder if there's a component of allergy with the PV horses, and I've had some that have responded really nicely with immunotherapy. Others who doesn't help at all. But to me, if you can spare a steroid, you should spare a steroid. Um, it's a very easy shot to give. She's actually giving you a vaccine. It's much easier than this, even. Um, we just use a teeny little TV syringe. You give it under the skin. I encourage you to give them a carrot and you give it to them. Life is good. Um, so that's something we do quite a lot of. And so that's pretty much all I got for hives and then for scratches. This is our cute little nanny who is doing beautifully on immunotherapy, by the way. Um, had a lot of really nice reactions. If you can do it in the tiny little critters. Um, you know, you have to be careful about the hay sources sometimes and also the fat pony. Um, but if you guys have any questions about scratches or hives, please tell me happy to take them. So my mare, um, by definition, has the scratches. Mm -hmm. it, it starts out well, it starts out with a bump mm -hmm. and then they ooze a little bit, they crust, the hair is in it, so you get the tufts. Yep. And then I can either catch it or they fall off, and then you've got like a little circle. Uh, maybe a pencil eraser size up to a dime size of skin, pink skin, like almost, and there's no blood, but you can, it's right down to your flesh. And then after a week, it heals. Yes. And she, besides a few on her legs, her chest gets them and her whole throat gets them. Yeah, so what your horse probably has, so she's talking about sort of like things that ooze and cross, and then you lose the hair in that area and then it fills in. Probably has an insect bite type. That's a classic pattern. She's getting bitten by those insects. She gets a small hive in the area. The hive oozes. You might get a little bacterial infection or not. It rips the hair off when it comes off, and then it gets better. So she needs to be better about fly control. How do you do with that? And that's yeah. usually early yeah. spring. So is there something like you just put spot on her? Um, well, I think a few things you can do is keeping them thin at the time. Both times makes a difference. Good fly spray. She'd be a great candidate for a neck and chest fly sheet. Um, you know, the sleazy kind of sheet can make a big difference for them. And that's what I would first do is try fly or to see if that can make a difference for them. Our child is donkey. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't get those per se, but what I've noticed on his legs, and it might be a similar thing. It's fly by. Yeah. It, it, well, it looks like giant flea dirt. Yeah, so he, gets, so he has what's called mosquito bite hypersensitivity. He actually has a specific fly by hypersensitivity that affects his leg and those fine little crusts. Again, good fly prevention would make a big difference, which is very hard in the tiny little dog. Um, so usually, swap, we put swap, and it's like, you know, why not just, you know, just have something you can eat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, just a, uh, two questions. Sure. Uh, about the mice. Yes, yeah, so it's rare that a dog is going to get choreopsis, but it could if it was really in close proximity. So if you have that Jack Russell that's rolling around in the um, you know shavings all the time, they could potentially get it. Yeah, absolutely. It's just not common that the dogs have that close proximity.
oh, cows are much better at surviving than horses in general. Right? So horses like to die, cows like to live. That's just a story. So you could have a cow live in a pot of poop, and it wouldn't matter. It would be fine. So the good news is you're probably okay with your cows all the time. If you did that to a herd of tommies, they would never survive. Oh my God. They would long die, right? Um, but that's the beauty of cows. They're fantastic. They are not Yes. So I have a horse with a skin problem, which bothers me way more than him. Classic. Yeah. If you are a horse owner, yeah. four different veterinarians. I mean, not wait. You might be. Yeah. You go through four vets. You haven't come to me. I didn't shame on you. I wasn't. I wasn't told, but that's okay. Doctor Smith did come out. Oh, good old Mary. And yeah. looked at that chicken. Oh, and yes. And I, I, yes. And I asked to while you were here. Sure. Can you check this out. So <coughs> I have a gray horse, uh -huh. and as um, it's undiagnosed, yeah. it's called a non-specific dermatitis, but it has to be something. I just refuse to accept. So that's a non-specific. That's a cop house. Yeah. It is a cop house. <laughs> So there are there are black black dots okay. on his all his legs, sure. and it spreads. Okay. It's he. I saw a new one yesterday under his neck. I examined him very close, carefully. Are they flat or are they raised? So okay. a little teeny weeny black, like the head of a pin. Sure. And on one of his the cannon bone of his hind leg, he came. Irritated and very pink, sure. and that was worrisome. And I actually love it because um, it's so troubling to me. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't itch. He doesn't bother with it. It's nothing. Um, I keep his legs clean. I've used lime sulfur dip for weeks. Um, it doesn't go away ever. It's he has it in the winter. He does grow a thick coat, but I can still see these bumps and. What the heck is it? Yeah. You know, and it's spreading. And have they been biopsied? Have you sent pieces? Not yet. Yeah, he so. won't trailer. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, I can't, I don't have a trailer. He won't even like, get it. I mean, I don't. Oh, shame on you. I mean, come on. I know. Mm -hmm. I haven't stopped to talk to him. Mm -hmm. I don't have. Yeah, so and that's so, a great question. So pictures are helpful to us. There are times when even me, as a dermatologist, that see everything every day, and need a biopsy to know what it is. I My thought would be papillomavirus, to be honest with you. I bet he's got papillomavirus. Um, and that can present an odd way that does a lot of weird things. There are 19 papillomaviruses in the horse for that one. Um, so there's a whole lot of them. And we've seen them present with little black bumps before. There's also other weird hair follicle tumors that they can get too. So there's some odd things out there. And I think a biopsy would probably be the best way for you to know what's going on. I'm happy to look at a picture. Um, I just may not be able to, to know that answer. Make, do you make cows crawl? We do not usually, unfortunately. Now, Mary Smith, I might be able to get one of our ambulatory people out and advise them on how I would collect the samples so they might be able to help you out for sure. Yeah, we've also got a couple of others that are really quite good, Sigmund Mon and a few other ambulatory practitioners that I like a lot. And I chat with them and I can say, here's a picture of the leg. Let me circle what I want you to do. I'll walk you through how to do it. Well, that was great. So I have to know. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Knowledge is power. I understand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I can look at the pictures after and see if anything comes to mind. But it may be that we talk about a biopsy as far as the next step. And that's okay. You know, that's that's a great way to get a definitive diagnosis. So horse germ is awesome, right? It's the best ever. Um, if you're going through four veterinarians, please call a dermatologist. <laughs> I'm here. It's a specialist for you. Um, if you guys have any questions afterwards,